are, we're going to be a little bit different tonight. Are you ready for that? Sure you are, because you have no idea what it is. Um, yeah, we are going to have tonight some periodical silence. This is going to be awkward at times. Can you do it? Yes, I know we hate silence, but it's good. It's good for us. So uh, I, gave you a, I gave you a card. Uh, we are going through a series. We're actually ending tonight, the series that Brian set up for us. Why does Jesus ask so many questions? He does. He asks a lot of questions. And sometimes we just want this really straight answer. And he comes back with another question. Tonight we're going to be looking at five questions on longing, and they're, they're, they're fairly personal, right? They're ancient. They're 2,000 years old, but they really resonate with our lives today. We'll have those longings, those things that we just wish God would do, we wish God wouldn't do, we wish were true, we wish weren't true, we just wish from the bottom of our soul. So we're going to be asking some of those. You have a card, and here's the deal. You're not going to have to turn that into anybody. Nobody's going to look at that. Somebody joked with me about, I gave you homework. I didn't give you homework. Um, what that is, is I really, want you to, I really want you to think through these. I had to look at them for myself this week and really think through them, and I, and I really found it a rewarding. Uh, for once, it wasn't me asking my own questions to myself. I really felt that Jesus was asking me questions, and I had to come up with an answer. And so I'm going to encourage you, if during our kind of pause times, our quiet times, you want to write down an answer during those times, that's great. If you can't do it that fast and you go, I need to think about this, I'd highly encourage you to take those cards with you, take them home, maybe tuck them in a Bible, and this week, work through those. Think through those. Ask yourself those questions. It's not really you asking yourself. It's really Jesus's questions uh, to us. And so we're going to be looking at tonight um, questions on longing. But let me pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for asking us questions. And tonight as we, for the last time in this series, see um, a picture of maybe why, why you ask questions, why you uh, get to the heart of things, how you use them to penetrate down into what's going on inside of us, God. I pray that you do that. I pray that you would ask us your questions tonight through your word, through your spirit that you'd be asking. Lord, if there's some tonight who um, would be uncomfortable with that, that that kind of encounter with you and with your word and making it that personal is, is uncomfortable and has been off limits until now, I pray that tonight you, you kick down the door a little bit. Um, I pray for those who do not know the answer to any of these questions, that you would shepherd them through uh, this week, this month, shepherd them through the answers. Uh, and Lord, uh, do your work, do your work through your, through your scripture tonight and in the coming week. Amen. All right. So we're going to go through five questions that Jesus asks. And the first one is, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Each of these come out of the Bible. I'll give you the passage that they come from. They're, they're, all, they're all from a story in the gospel. What are you looking for? And this one is our first one. There's a flow to this because this one really is the overarching one. They, all the others kind of come underneath this. But what are you looking for is our first question we're going to think through tonight. This comes from John 1.38. Jesus, very, very early in his ministry, before his disciples have really assembled, he's, he's cruising from place to place, and it says, you know, these guys are following him, and Jesus turned, and he saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Which is kind of a non sequitur, right? It doesn't follow right. This happens all the time in the Bible, and that's when we're, our, 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 you know, little logic flag should go up, and we perk up and go, what's going on here? Where, what are you seeking? Where are you staying? That doesn't, like, that doesn't go together. But what he's asking, I think, is deeper than just, why are you following me? Which would make sense. Why are you following me? What do you want? Who are you? He knows those things, but he's, he's not asking them because he doesn't know why they're being weird and creepy. He's asking them because he's saying, what are you seeking? What are you really looking for? What are you really after? These are disciples that, that, that have their, their radar on. They're, they know that, you know, maybe this guy's the Messiah. And I, we're not going to get into any of these passages tonight. That's not the night. Um, but I want to just set up the question for you. When he turns around, he looks him in the eye and he says, what are you seeking? And they say, where are you staying? Why? Because what they're seeking, they think maybe this is what we're seeking. Maybe you're the one we've been seeking. Maybe you're the one we've been waiting for for thousands of years. Maybe you're the one. Maybe you're the promised one. And so we want to come in closer. We want to get to know you. We want to hear directly from you. Where are you staying? How can we, can we, can we, can we talk about it? Can we get together? If you ever talk to somebody and you just ask them what you think is a casual question, right? How are you? And they go, um, can we talk? Oh, okay, 
Suddenly the tone shifted. That's what's going on here. What are you looking for? Um, where, 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 where are you staying these days? Can we come? That's what's happening. They're leaning into Jesus, right? They're, 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 they're seeking him. And that I want to set up our night with is that question of what are you seeking? And that's basically what we're going to do tonight. What are you seeking? Is it Jesus? I, mean, I guess if we were to reframe the night, that's what it would be. What are you seeking? Is it Jesus? So when they come in and they, they want to they lean into that, my first question for you is, what are you seeking? What have you been looking for maybe your whole life? What have you been after? What has been driving you? What, what makes your decisions for you? What pushes you? What pulls you? What inspires you? What terrifies you? What is the thing that you'd go, if I could just get over this hill, ah, everything would be fine. If I could just this, if this would just happen, this is the goal, this is the end, this is the thing. What is that thing? What is that thing? And so I'm gonna let Jesus ask you that question. We're actually gonna pause and it's gonna feel awkward to some of us, but again, this is good. This is a good thing. If you're watching online and you think the air just went dead and the video feed just cut out, we didn't just cut out, right? If you're in Target right now and it's the future, just keep shopping and just keep thinking because we will, we will come back, I promise. It's, not, it's nothing freaky. So let's take a second and ask yourself, write down an answer if you want. What are you, what have you been seeking? When you approach the Bible, when you approach a sermon, God's Word, what you're going to find in it is what you're looking for most of the time. And so if you're looking for something small, you actually get something small out of it. There was a Bible survey uh, done in 2016, and the number one reason people said that they approach the Bible is for comfort. Comfort is not wrong, and the Bible offers comfort. But when we come looking for only that, we miss maybe what God has there. And so when we, when we come to uh, when we come to the Bible, we should always be looking for Jesus. I love this quote. I'm going to get it tattooed on my forehead. It's by a guy named Trevin Wax, uh, which is a cool name. Um, he says, go to the Bible looking for God. Find him and application will follow. But go looking for application and you may miss both. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that and flesh all of that out. But what I, what I really want to say is, um, if what you're seeking, even when you come to church, even when you come to the Bible, is really you and not really Jesus, you're really going to not find him. And by not finding him, you're not going to find yourself and you'll find yourself lost. And so uh, that's our first question is, what are, you, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? Our second question tonight, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Um, I ask this question, right, a lot actually of people. There's, there's times where, you know, you, people will start talking and you're like, what are you, it's kind of the first question, it's kind of the second question, like, what are you, what are you, what are you after? Like, what are you asking? What do you, what is your, what is your need? What is your request? What is your, sometimes I'll even ask people like, what is, they're saying, I want prayer. This isn't to offend anybody if I've ever said this to you. Um, I want prayer. And then, you know, for a while, I'm, I'm not sure about, about what? Prayer, prayer for what? What is your, what do you, what do you want to ask God for? And that sometimes kind of uh, makes people pause and go, oh, oh, well, I guess if I had to articulate it, it would be this. Okay, great. Let's pray for that. But sometimes we don't know. So this question is a good question because sometimes we're not immediately sure of if I could ask God, what would I ask God for? And so we're going to look quickly at two stories where Jesus asked this question uh, with two very different outcomes. The first one is in Mark 10, 35 through 40. James and John, two of his disciples, it says, uh, the sons of Zebedee came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Wow. 
These are good type A boys. If you read another gospel, they have a tiger mom who's like, go, go ask him, you know, be successful. You have to go. You know, this is how they were raised. And so we want you to do whatever we ask of you. We're going to go. We're going to grasp it. We're going to, you know, da, da, all that stuff. And he said to them, I would insert very wisely, he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I would drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but is for those to whom, for whom it has been prepared. Um, again, we're not fleshing out any of these scriptures. We're not doing a, an individual Bible study on any one. But essentially what's happening here is, is somebody's coming to him with, with their request, right? It's not wrong to make a bold request, but they say, in your glory. But I really think under the surface what they're really concerned about, and if we look in the context, what they're really concerned about is their glory, not his glory. And so Jesus is going to check their question with a question, right? What do you want me to do for you? Well, I want this. Oh, okay, right? Sometimes this question, really what it does is it penetrates down to what are our motives. The book of James says that you, you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So here's two people who are asking out of pride rather than out of humility, wanting God's glory. They want their glory. And so Jesus uh, answers this in a fashion, but he definitely doesn't answer their request. What do you uh, what do you want me to do for you? He asked the same question in Matthew 20, verses 29 through 34. It says, And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Very different outcome. Here's the cry of the humble who know who Jesus is, who really glorify him by calling him the Lord, the son of David. And their request is much, much smaller than James and John. James and John made this big request, let us sit in your glory in the kingdom. These blind men, they just, I just wanna see again. Or maybe for the first time, I just wanna see. Would you restore our sight? It's a much smaller request, but it's brought in humility and in earnestness. This is their longing. And so it doesn't matter if your longing is, is so big that you're like, I don't think I could ask God this. Yes, you can. And if your longing is so small, you go, I don't know if God would care about this. Yes, he will. We bring our longings to the Lord. And so uh, his question for you, and take, we're gonna take a second here, is what do you want me to do for you? Why does he ask this again? Before you, before you pause, he asks this because we don't always immediately know what it is we want. And when somebody makes us articulate it, we have to choose. Now, do not choose like Aladdin, like I got three wishes or one wish or, okay, this is the only thing I can ask God, so it better be good. No, you can ask a bunch of stuff. It's all good. But what's in there? What have you been asking God for? And something in you goes, I can't ask that again. He won't answer that one. He won't do that. Be specific. What is it? Lay your cards out before the Lord. Challenge him if you want to challenge him with something big. Be bold. But if it's something small, then be small and be simple and be earnest and say, God, in humility, this is my request. And so let's take a moment. Write if you want to write. Pray if you want to pray. Think if you want to think. But ask, let God ask you, what do you want me to do for you?
Our third question from Jesus is, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? This seems like a dumb question. Let me tell you a story where this comes from and you're going to go, gosh, Jesus asks obvious questions. Well, does he? Let's read. John 5, 2 through 9. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after stirring the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he uh, already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I was coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Again, we're not going to get into this whole story and is there really an angel that stirs the water and they get healed by that, and I don't think so, but that's not the point for this. The point for this is the question that Jesus asks him. It seems like a Captain Obvious question, right? You've been here 38 years. 28? 38. I lost my number in there somewhere. 38. He's probably emaciated probably has his own filth on him. He's humiliated. He's desperate. He's defeated. This isn't going to work. Why am I even still here? I don't know. I don't have anywhere else to go, but this isn't working. I'm just stuck. He's just stuck. He's just walked over, literally walked over, literally, literally stepped on. This is his life. And Jesus comes and he says, well, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Why would he ask him something like that? Why would he ask that question? That question seems so obvious. But the man immediately goes into the reasons why he hasn't been made well yet. Why I haven't healed myself yet. Why I haven't done it yet. Well, I, haven't, I, can't, I can't scramble down there. Here's the reasons. Why. That's not what Jesus asked. What's fascinating about this too, I'm so fascinated because Jesus actually heals him when he doesn't really answer the question very well. Jesus actually responds by healing him, but that's the same question I want you to let Jesus ask you tonight is, do you want to be made well? Because we would all say, of course I do, duh. But this question is not a duh question. Human nature is not as simple as, I want to be made well, and I'm not well, so I'm not happy. That is not, it is not that simple. Do you really want to be made well? I'm going to uh, read you a little section here of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, that he published in 1945. For context, it's a kind of a parable allegory, if you will, so don't take this as a theological truth or anything like that. He didn't mean it that way, and it's not that way. But uh, C.S. Lewis writes a book where uh, these, these people who have gone to hell that he calls ghosts, uh, they get on a bus and they go and get to take kind of a field trip to heaven and respond to what heaven's like, which if that sounds crazy, it's, it's really to explore like the human soul and, and human depravity and I won't get into it. But uh, I'm going to read just a section to you. There's one guy, again, called a ghost at this point, and he has this red lizard on his shoulder and the red lizard like keeps whispering things to him and nobody, nobody knows what the red lizard's saying, but it just keeps telling him things and he encounters, um, he encounters this angel there in heaven and the angel is, is kind of talking and kind of almost like the tour guide and the, the lizard's whispering and the guy goes, oh, uh, uh, sorry, I, I have to leave, I have to leave. Um, and so let me, let me pick up there and I'll, I'll read it to you because the, ghost, or the, the angel says, are you leaving so soon? He says, yes, I'm off, said the ghost. Thanks for all your hospitality, but it's, it's no good, you see. I, I told this little chap, here he indicated the lizard, that he'd have to be quiet if he came, which he insisted on doing. Of course, his stuff won't do here. I realize that, but he won't stop. I shall just have to go home. Would you like me to make him quiet, said the flaming spirit, an angel as I now understood. Of course I would, said the ghost. Then I will kill him, said the angel taking a step forward. Oh, uh, look out, you're burning me. Keep away, said the ghost, retreating. Don't you want him killed? You didn't say anything about killing him at first. I, I, I hardly meant to bother you with anything so drastic as that. It's the only way, said the angel, whose burning hands were now very close to the lizard. Shall I kill it? Well, that's a further question. I'm uh, quite open to consider it, but it's a new point, is it? I mean, for the moment, I was only thinking about silencing it because uh, up here, well, it's so embarrassing. May I kill it? Well, there's time to discuss that later. There is no time. May I kill it? 
Please, I never meant to be such a nuisance. Please, really, don't bother. Look, it's going to sleep of its own accord. I'm sure it'll be all right now. Thanks ever so much. May I kill it? Uh, honestly, I, I don't think there's the slightest necessity for that. I'm sure I'll be able to keep it in order now. I think the gradual process would be far better than killing it. The gradual process is of no use at all. Don't you think so? Well, I think over the... Uh, if you think over it... Care very, uh, sorry. Well, I think... I'll think over it, what you've said, very carefully. I honestly will. In fact, I'd let you kill it now, but as a matter of fact, I'm not feeling frightfully well today. It would be silly to do it now. I need to be in good health for the operation some other day, perhaps. There is no other day. All days are present now. Get back. You're burning me. How can I tell you to kill it? You, you'd kill me if you did. It is not so. Why? You're hurting me now. I never said it wouldn't hurt you. I said I wouldn't kill you. Oh, I know, you think I'm a coward, but it isn't that. Really, it isn't. I say, let me run back to tonight's bus and get an opinion from my doctor. I'll come again in the first moment I can. This moment contains all moments. Why are you torturing me? You're jeering at me. How can I let you tear me to pieces? If you wanted to help me, why didn't you kill the thing without asking me before I knew? It would all be over by now if you had. I cannot kill it against your will. It is impossible. Have I your permission? The angel's hands were almost closed on the lizard, but not quite. Then the lizard began chattering to the ghost so loud that even I could hear what it was saying. Be careful, it said. He can do what he says. He can kill me. One fatal word from you and he will. Then you'll be without me forever and ever. It's not natural. How could you live? You'd only be a sort of ghost, not a real man as you are now. He doesn't understand. It may be natural for him, but it isn't for us. Yes, yes. I know there are no real pleasures now, only dreams, but aren't they better than nothing? Ah, oh, and I'll be so good. I admit I'll, I've sometimes gone too far in the past, but I promise I won't do it again. I'll give you nothing but really nice dreams, all sweet and fresh and almost innocent. Have I per your permission, said the angel to the ghost? I know it'll kill me. It won't, but supposing it did. You're right. It would be better to be dead than to live with this creature. Then I may? Blast you, go on, can't you? Get it over, do what you like, bellowed the ghost, but ended whimpering, God help me, God help me. And eventually he consents to the angel taking away this, this lizard that's been plaguing him, torturing him, oppressing him, and he turns into a horse and rides away, but that's not the point. Um, but I hope you get the point. Do you want to be made well is not a simple question. It's not a simple question. Because being made well means offering yourself holy body and soul to God to do with as he pleases whatever end may come. And being made well sometimes means that I have to give up the thing that I held on to that let me feel that I was right in this world. I was a victim in this world. I collected my injustices in this world and if I were made well, I'd have to let that go and I can't let that go. I might have to let go of something practical like my own finances. I might have to let go of some time. I might have to let go of a relationship that I want that, that seems to want me. I might have to let go of something in order to be made well. I might have to lose something. I might have to sacrifice something. I might have to deal with the difficulty of change. No change is easy, even when it's a change for the good. We're sometimes puzzled. Why wouldn't that person just change their life and, and everything would be better? Really? How, how easily do you deal with change? How easily do you just suddenly make changes in your life because it would be better if? The human soul is complicated, and when Jesus says, do you want to be made well, that is a very real question and not a very obvious question because it takes away all of our excuses, takes away all of our plans, takes away all of our attempts to heal ourselves. That's a very real question, so I'm going to let Jesus ask it to you. So take a moment and let Jesus ask you, do you really want to be made well no matter what?
Okay, our fourth question, our fourth question from Jesus. Do you love me? Do you love me? This comes from John 21, verses 15 through 17. Jesus has risen from the dead and he's come to see his disciples there. They're on the, they're on a, uh, on a, on a lake shore and they're, they eat breakfast together. Uh, for context, Peter has denied Jesus three times at his crucifixion. This is obviously after that. So Jesus comes and it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Do you love me? The first question we asked was, who are you seeking? What are you seeking? Is it Jesus? What are you seeking? Is it Jesus? Um, do you love Jesus? Do you love him more than the solution you long for? Do you love him more than the goal that you have? Do you love him more? Pastor Dan has challenged me uh, really in his messages, not, not, I guess not directly, but uh, I, I still think about this just for years now. He said, do you want Jesus more than you want the solution to your problems? And so often my answer is just an honest no. I really just want this or that to be fixed and I want Jesus to do it, and so I can be like, yay, Jesus, but it's not the Jesus I, I want, it's the solution that I want. Do you love me, he's asking. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me more than what I can do for you? Do you love, you, do you love him more than sin that we cling to? Do you love him more than the, the thing or the person? Maybe you lose, lo fear losing. Uh, do you love him, do you long for him more than everything else? Uh, let me interrupt here as well interrupt myself, I guess. I don't know if you can do that, but I do it often. Uh, Jesus longs for you. When we talk about longing and questions, do you realize that Jesus longs for you? If you look at the breadth of the Bible and its whole story, it's a story of God designing a world that would be good, that all people would live in and know him and worship him and enjoy him and be fed with him and, and be in fellowship with him. That's the existence God wanted in the beginning and we broke it, but God spends the rest of the Bible rebuilding it uh, more than I think it was originally uh, designed. He just, he goes, he goes crazy with it. It's amazing. That's what God longs for. He longs for you to be with him. He longs for your fellowship. Because he longs for you, it gives us a clue to the fact that why do we long for him? That should be our longing. And not only should be our longing, as though I'm telling you, like, you should long more for, for the Lord, because that's frustrating to just say that and have somebody go, well, I, I, I don't know that I do. Well, the Bible says that God works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So when we don't long for him, what can we do? We say, God, I need you to help me long for you. And I'm sorry if I'm speaking in circles, but, but why, would we, why would we bother to ask him to long for him? Because ultimately, we really do. Under the surface there, we, what we are designed for is him. We're designed for fellowship in him. Nothing else satisfies. And our whole lives are just trying to find that somewhere else. And he's saying, actually, I long for you and I've designed you to long for me as well. God loves God in the Trinity. We are made in God's image, so we love God. We are designed to worship him, to enjoy him, to be with him. And so under the surface here is a God who longs for and loves us, a God who's jealous for us. And he says, your longings are made perfect in him. And so he's asking, do you love me? Do you love me? I get challenged by that often. The funny thing in my life is I often ask God the same question. God, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And when the tables are turned, the calculus changes when he says, Andrew, do you love me? Oh, well, I don't know, God. I don't know that was part of this, right? I do, but I struggle. I struggle with it. Do you love me? I like duty. And God says, well, I'm going to take you beyond just duty and obedience to actually loving me. I like responsibility. God says, I'm going to take you beyond that to loving me. For some of you, it's, no, I, I, I'm afraid. And God says, I'm going to take you beyond fear to loving me. But the question stands, do you love me? And so I want you to ask, well, again, let Jesus ask you, do you love him? Take a moment.
Okay, <clears throat> our last question for the night. <laughs> what is that to you? What is kind of an insulting question. What is that to you? Comes from the same story, same passage. A little bit later, uh, Peter is, is pointing at, at John the disciple, and he's like, well, what about him? What about that guy? What about his future? What about his deal? What about, what about him? And Jesus says there in, in John 21, 22, uh, if it is my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. What is that to you? You follow me. What is Jesus asking here? He's saying, what if I do things according to your, your plan? Okay. What if I don't do things according to your plan? Okay. What is that to you? Who made you author of the universe? Who made you the writer of history? Nobody. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the creator. He knows what is best. Can you submit to him all of, the, all of your longing? Can you take that thing, right? That thing that um, maybe you wrote it down. Maybe you're not even sure what it is. Can you take that thing? Can you take that person? Can you take that, that wish, that desire? Can you take that hope, that dream? Can you take that fear? Can you take that, that deep down longing and say, God, whatever you want to do with this is up to you. That's hard. That's hard. But you know what? That's actually the, the, the path to peace in this the path of peace. Sometimes, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but sometimes the Lord waits on us to give it back to him before he goes, okay, now you can have it. Now that this isn't an idol in your life, here it is. Now that this hasn't taken my place, let me give it to you. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I cannot promise that to you. I'm not God either. But I want you to, I want you to let God ask you if I do that or if I don't do that. What is that to you? Can you submit that to him? And actually, uh, if the band wants to come back out, we'll close. Take a moment and think through that question. Let's pray. Holy Father, we, we trust you, but help us where we don't trust you with each of these questions. And Lord, each one that um, maybe we don't like our answer to, maybe we don't know our answer to, uh, maybe we know our answer and are afraid that it's just the wrong answer. Father God, would you continue to ask us these questions, get down deep into what do we long for? Lord, make it you, make it you. Even if it takes the rest of our lives, make our longings you, because deep down that's, that's what you've designed us to long for and therefore to be satisfied in. Go to put our, our needs before you. We even put our wants before you. The things on the paper that are not, not earth shattering, not cosmic, but are just something that somebody just said, Lord, would you just do this for me that I may enjoy you more? Would you give me this gift? Lord, I pray that you would answer that. Answer that for them. Lord, the, the requests, the things, the longings that are, are out of maybe pride, out of sin, out of fear, out of selfishness, whatever it may be, Lord God, uh, in your mercy, would you say no? Would you take those away from us? Allow us no idols. And God, we pray, Lord, that, that you, that you would be our greatest love. You would be our only fear. You would be our deepest relationship. You would teach us satisfaction in you. Continue to ask us questions, Lord, but continue to be our answer. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.